started. Arthur Brandwood, ladies and gentlemen, it's 1.04 a.m. down under. But God bless him. He's there. He's got his rugby shirt on and he wants to educate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, I, I don't know how many. I see six people. I presume there are others I can't see. There, um, are, there are 15 of us right now. Good, good. OK. Um, I, I wanted to talk a bit about biocompatibility and I'm going to refrain from from trying to do biocompatibility 101. Um, but I, uh, uh, I, I've I have a couple of slides. I, I've heard a lot of work. I can I can multitask. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I've got a couple of slides to show in a moment. What I, um, I I've been involved um, in writing the biocompatibility standards since the the ISO committee that does that was established in um, 1991. I'm not quite. I haven't been involved since the the beginning. I got involved in the second year, but it's still an awful lot of years. Um, and it's been an interesting journey um, trying to write those standards and the way they've developed and there's a huge amount of work been done um, and, and where we've ended up. Um, and I thought I might tell the story of that a little bit and just, just um, you know, because everybody knows that there's this bunch of standards and they think about them as a set of tests, but, you know, the, 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 there's a sort of small, a relatively small group of people that, have done all this work and and, uh, and and a fairly tight knit group, and they've done it over a long period of time. And what has been going on in the standards committee is not necessarily um, what was intended by the authors of the standards. It's not necessarily what happened when the things were used in the real world and used by regulators and used by the industry. So I, I find that an interesting story. So I thought I'd just tell that story, um, and then we can kick around our experiences. Um, now, I don't know how much of the audience knows anything about biocompatibility, so I'm assuming zero. Uh, I know there's a number of people I can see here that know quite a bit, um, so please excuse me, <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to sort of start from simple. But let me just um, uh, pull up the slides and share the screen. Um, there. So just Do I need to show my screen? You're going to, uh, here we go. Um, so if I go. I tell you, I recognize to a name everyone on the call, and most people have self selected and come to hear about biocompatibility. <laughs> Good. I, I'm pretty now, much the odd man out who's like, whatever. Go ahead. So you should see a, a, a title page with a, a laboratory yeah. rat sitting. Yeah. Okay, I call it biocompatibility, chemistry, biology, and risk, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about each of those three things. Um, and the checklist looks a bit odd, but it will become obvious uh, shortly. Um, I'll skip over this. This is just um, the, the usual uh, template slide that goes at the beginning of all my um, uh, presentations, which uh, people can be at the end. It should be at the end. Thank you. Um, the marketer says so. It's, it's, it. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's one o'clock in the morning. Okay, um, when you prepared it during business hours, go on. <laughs> and and my kitchen looks a bit like this. Um, uh, coffee pots. When you're making coffee, of course, what you're doing is you're taking a a, a, um, a solid coffee bean or coffee grounds and you're passing a, a solvent through it and making an extract, which we call coffee, we drink. Um, if you're dealing with medical devices um, and you're thinking about the biological safety, uh, the same principle applies. We're not worried about the titanium that's used in the case of that pacemaker. We're not worried about the silicone in the lead or the polyurethane in the header because these are all pretty inert, solid, insoluble substances that have no biological effect. Um, we're not worried about the, the synthetic rubber in those nitrile gloves either. Um, same thing. The, 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 so why do we do biocompatibility? Um, we're worried about all of the things that, that can be drawn out of there in the same way that you can draw coffee out of coffee grounds. Um, so biocompatibility is all about the soluble substances that come out of medical devices and whether those substances are poisonous or not. That's the simplest way I can describe biocompatibility. And um, 
the next step of it is, well, what happens when those soluble substances come out and, the, and, and you can get effects which are local to the vice, so you can get a, an allergic reaction right on the skin from wearing a medical glove. Um, you can get effects which are distant from the device. The patient can get sick because they're poisoned because something's come out of that implant um, and, uh, and caused a toxic effect. I'm not going to go into detail of all of that at all, um, but basically what we're thinking about is, well, stuff comes out of devices, it can affect locally to where the device touches the patient, or it can affect the whole system. Um, and uh, we need to test things uh, to, to understand what kind of effects we might or might not see. Um, and basically what you're doing is you're making coffee. You, you're taking the medical device, um, you're chopping it up, uh, dissolving it in a, uh, putting it in a solvent, see what comes out, and then you administer that solvent to uh, cell cultures or to laboratory rats in various ways to test for all of those things I've talked about. Um, now, it's not quite the full story. There's a couple of things which are physical effects, but let's just uh, focus on the, the toxicity effects at the moment. Um, this all started back in 1986 with this thing called the tripartite guidance. There was a subcommittee of, um, of a, uh, established between three regulatory authorities, the US, Canada, and the United Kingdom. And they wrote a guidance about um, biocompatibility testing and it looked like this. It was a, essentially was a checklist. Um, uh, you can't read that. Um, I'll come back to it later. Um, but it, but uh, essentially, the columns are all the different types of things you want to test, and the, the rows are the level of invasiveness. The more invasive a device is, um, the more you test. So a Band-Aid is not invasive. Um, a, a pacemaker is highly invasive. And basically, you test more according to the longer a device is used or the more invasive it gets. That was back then, and it was essentially um, a, a list of possible tests, and it said in there that these tests might be useful. Um, doesn't mean we want you to do them all, but they might be useful. You need to think about these things. Um, unfortunately, right back then, it, we started off uh, with a checklist. And the way this has been used is, uh, has been as a checklist of just things to be tested. Um, and that's not how the standards committee that went on to take this tripartite guidance and turn it into an ISO standard was ever trying to work. And I don't think it's what the people in, in the tripartite guidance wanted either. What they were saying was, think about the, the, the items in this list and decide what you need to do. Um, there's very wealthy laboratory businesses being built on just testing everything where there's a tick in a box. Um, now, here's uh, the body of work that's been developed at ISO. There's a thing called Technical Committee 194. That's the committee I've been a member of. Um, uh, I think I'm the second longest standing member of that committee, which, uh, which amazes me, but um, I've been doing it since uh, 1992 or something, so it's what, 27 years? Um, and over that time, this committee has developed a um, bunch of standards. The first one is the part one standard, the main biocompatibility document. It's got that checklist within it. Um, there's a whole bunch of standards on how to then do the tests by taking these extracts and doing cell culture tests, doing sensitiz sensitization tests for allergic reaction, injecting them into, into animals to look at systemic toxicity, toxicity and poisoning, doing similar things to look at cancer and gene toxicity, and so on. A whole lot of biology. Um, since then, there's other things being added. There's a specific set of tests on uh, a specific set of requirements for um, ethylene oxide residuals, which are a special subset of biocompatibility. We've got st stuff to look after the animals. There's a standard on the animal welfare. Um, a whole bunch of very detailed technical supporting reports. Then we've got um, a bunch of chemistry that's been written. Um, very detailed standards on how to look for degradation products and how to characterize the materials in a device and how to look what can be leached out of them. So a whole bunch of chemistry standards. And then if that wasn't enough, there's a risk assessment standard which talks about um, how you take all this information and read the literature and figure out whether there's actually a hazard there that you have to do anything at all. Um, and 
we've now uh, written some extra standards on uh, materials of biological origin, collagens and the like, and recently, very topical right now, um, standards on doing biological safety in breathing gas pathways for ventilators and the like, because there the exposure is through an inhaled gas rather than through a direct contact, and it's a different way of doing things. And if we didn't, still didn't have enough to do, we wrote a clinical trial standard on the way. That's 28 years of work. Um, I don't know how many hundreds of pages of technical documentation there is there. I'm not going to talk about even one of them, um, apart from the part one. Um, but there's a big body of work, and my point is there's the biology, there's the testing, but there's also a big chunk of chemistry there. And why is that? Um, I have a question. So, and my, yeah, why question? Don't I, yes, please. If you go back to the previous slide. Yeah, go back one. Please. So if, you're, if your intent by laying all of this out on one page was to overwhelm us, good job. And yeah, second is... There's How, two words focus on biology and chemistry, but carry on, sorry. Um, if I'm coming to market with an implantable, how many of these things do I have to do? All of them? No, well, that's the whole point. And I'll come back to that if I may, Joe. Um, the, 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 that's been the problem, is that uh, people have been test doing particularly the biology on everything in that checklist. That's what I want to talk about. Um, and but, you believe that's too much? Yeah, in many cases. Okay. In many cases. So uh, we'll, I'll come back to if I can take your question on notice and, and read. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Back. Thank you. Um, so uh, please don't worry about the detail of this slide. The point is there's a whole bunch of standards on biological testing involving cells and rats and stuff. And there's a whole bunch of standards on understanding the materials, the chemistry. And there's a reason for both of those things. Um, and I've got this slide that says fighting this checklist. So here's that checklist that came out of that initial tripartite guidance that got put into the ISO document. And here's, um, you know, 20 something years of work on refining the documents. Along the top are all the times that the ISO document got revised. And then along come the FDA with its own guidance on the bottom. Um, and you'll notice a couple of things. Um, the first is that it starts off talking about selecting tests and then gradually it gets away from testing to something we call evaluation and risk management. So what that's about is not just blindly employing a lab to test everything that's on that list, but to actually understand the device do evaluation and consider it in terms of biological and toxicological risk. And the FDA has been disagreeing with the ISO committee for, for 30 years and has, has been bringing out its own guidances which modify what ISO is putting out. Um, and that was going on forever until the latest revision where we finally brought both together. Um, so FDA used to do things like this. Here's the checklist and they used to add extra ticks in the boxes. They say, we don't think ISO is asking you to do enough testing. We want you to do more. And they put all those, where there's a zero on the on the box here, an O, um, that's where they want you to do extra testing. Um, the latest edition, we did two things. Um, we added an extra column which said chemistry. So all the other columns of biology, the extra column said chemistry. And the X says you actually have to do that. You actually have to understand the chemistry. Um, and then we changed all the X's in all the other boxes to E's for evaluate. And there's a footnote in there somewhere that says, where there's an E, it means you have to consider it and decide whether you need to do any testing or whether you've got enough information from other places, including from chemistry, to not need to do the testing. So the whole idea is that experts look at this and decide what needs to be done. Um, now, a couple of other interesting things have happened. Um, Bob Prisgoda from uh, J&J Ethicon, member of the committee for many years, um, did some work a few years back where he said he, he asked a question about um, the sensitivity, the, 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 uh, the, 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 how sensitive the, the biological tests are for actually detecting um, a poison if it's present. So he did a whole lot of, if you want to read this thing, it's in detail, but basically he looked at um, how 
people were testing for cancer forming, cancer causing agents in medical devices. And he came to the conclusion that something like four out of five of the assays were just not sensitive enough, were actually missing the presence of a cancer causing agent. In other words, these tests in this checklist we've been relying on for so long were actually not very good tests. At the same time, he said, he asked, this, he asked himself, well, what if I use state of the art chemistry today with, you know, chromatographs and aspects and all that and try and identify the substances directly uh, and, and characterize what I can extract from a device using chemistry and quantitate that and say, well, I know how much of that stuff is in there. Is that something I need to worry about? And he came to the answer that actually the chemistry is a whole lot better. And so that's been driving um, the whole risk management chemistry stuff that we can say, well, if we can understand the material and if we can quantitate exactly what's present and we go to the scientific literature and say, well, we know that, yeah, that stuff, those substances are not dangerous or this one's a dangerous substance, but there's so little of it there that we don't actually need to worry about it because the chances are of causing a problem are very, very small, then the chemistry is better. Um, so, you know, you, you have still have the choice of doing the biology or you have the choice of taking your extracts and putting them through a machine in a lab and looking at the chemistry instead and understanding it from knowing exactly what's going on rather than using an imperfect biological test. So that's a quick skate through the arguments that have been going on in, the, in this committee for a long time. Um, this is another thing out of that part one standard. There's a flow chart. It starts up at the top. And um, now the flowchart says, do the chemistry at the beginning. And then, and then it says, uh, once you've done the chemistry, ask yourself, are the materials safe? Do, are they the same as other things? A whole bunch of questions. And if, if, you, if you can answer all of those, then you don't need to do the biology. It's only if you can't understand the material fully through chemistry and through comparison with others that you then need to do biological testing. But notice it's the last step. Now that's completely the opposite way around to the way people have been doing biocompatibility for the last 25 years, because what people have been doing is going to the checklist, looking for the ticks in the boxes, hiring a lab and saying, please do biology, please do animal tests, cell culture tests, where there's a tick in the box, um, and we'll send that to the regulator. And regulators have been expecting that. And that's the problem, is that they're still expecting that. Um, they're getting better at it, and it depends on which particular review you get. But still, the mindset is still very much, let's keep on doing cell culture tests and injecting rats with extracts. Um, so here's the key questions that come out of this. Um, do we understand the device? Are we got something toxic present that can come out? How much? Is that something to worry about? Is it below a safety threshold? Because you know, we hear lots of stories of cancer-causing agents being present in talcum powder and all the rest of it. But the question is, how much? Because generally, it's very, very small amounts. And even if it is cancer-causing, the, the risks are very low. Um, buried within those standards, there's a, there's a, a threshold, a thing called a threshold toxicological concern. Um, there's a threshold below which we say we don't worry. It actually comes out of the drug world. It's a, principle that comes from drugs. And that threshold is based on um, an amount of stuff that's in there that may be poisonous, but but the amount that's present means that you've got less than a one in a hundred thousand chance of getting cancer from the amount that's present. Now, if you think that the chances of somebody getting cancer for all of us on this call over a lifetime, and it's a lifetime chance, is one in three then the safety level that's built into this is extraordinary. We're looking at a very, very high factor of safety. So that's the sort of thing that's going on at the, in, in terms of these risk assessments and the chemistry. Um, and if we can show by chemistry there's nothing hazardous present or there's, it's very sl small, then we can spur that laboratory rat. Now, can caveats, it's not always clear cut. It's not easy. Doing the chemistry well can be expensive and a little bit slow. Um, um, and some things it doesn't work for. Those allergic responses, you've still got to do a bit of a biological test because that doesn't depend on dose. So there are some exceptions. But you see my point here is that what we've been trying to do in the, in the, in the committee is 
build all this body of information on how to understand the device from a chemical point of view, because the biology is actually not very accurate. Um, but what we now need to do is go through a cultural change of, of, of manufacturers and laboratories and regulators looking at bio, biological safety through the lens of chemistry. Um, I, and it requires risk assessment, and I want to bring it around to the last two quick slides. Um, this one's very topical. Um, the patient is still breathing. Um, one of my team is a, um, an expert on ventilators. Uh, he uh, used to work at a, a, a ventilator company, and um, he, is, he was involved in writing those ventilator safety testing standards, and he got involved in advising uh, a number of government bodies in the last few weeks, uh, including the United Kingdom and some here in Australia, on these minimum standards that they've been writing to ventilators, um, so the people can make ventilators in an emergency for the COVID epidemic. And uh, one of the questions that came up was, well, you know, how careful do we have to be about materials? Because the materials testing that goes into ventilators is really quite strict. All of those tubes are medical grade, they're very expensive. And the answer was, well, you know, we might have a one in 10,000 chance of causing a problem if you don't use the right material. We don't know. It's probably less than that. But if you don't use the ventilator, you've got a one in one chance that the patient will stop breathing. So, you know, there's a, <laughs> there's, a there's other things to worry about here. Um, and even in normal times, critical device like this, uh, the, the risks from biological safety are pretty small. Um, but how do we change the regulators to look at this? Um, uh, we'll talk in a minute about what people's experiences are, but here's a picture taken uh, in Beijing um, about three, four years ago. Uh, I arranged this, this uh, full day seminar, which is taking place in the Center for Medical Device Evaluation um, uh, for the Chinese regulatory authorities. And sitting up on the front, the, uh, the lady on the left is from Medtronic, um, Guys all in the front, uh, Bob Chris Goder, I talked about from Ethicon, uh, a couple of my team, uh, Sue Q from TGA. In other words, a bunch of experts from the ISO committee. Um, we took them to China and we gave them a full day's training on all of the stuff I've just been talking about. And they were very keen and there must have been 120 different reviewers in the room from the China FDA as it was then. Um, really keen to learn about this new paradigm in biocompatibility. And in the discussion at the end, I said to them, okay, you've seen this, the idea of using chemistry, using risk assessments, would you be prepared to accept biological safety, biocompatibility files based on risk assessment and based on understanding the chemistry? And the thing, the answer I got blew me away. They said, yes, we understand this. We've known about it for a while. We're very much ready to accept it. But the industry keeps sending us packages of test reports on laboratory animals. They keep sending us the biological stuff and they don't do this. Um, so the, the, they were saying as a regulator, they were prepared to look at it, um, but they're just not seeing the industry coming to the party and doing this. Um, and, and I know that the, there are still parts of the CFDA, it depends on the division you're dealing with, that still are very strict and want to see the biological testing. But generally that agency is, because of some of these interactions with the ISO committee, has gone ahead with the rest of the world in, in being a lot more relaxed about the ways biocompatibility are dealt with. They no longer require you to test in China and that sort of thing. So there's cultural change taking place there. Um, I'll uh, stop at that point. That's, I just wanted to give that overview, uh, the story of what's been going on in that committee. Um, it's been a frustrating ride because we've had uh, strong input from regulators wanting to be very strict about doing lots of extra testing and then finally getting around to a risk model which is still extraordinarily conservative um, but there are a lot of vested interests in carrying on doing this biology um, it requires less thought but it's a whole lot less accurate it's actually less safe um, in my view um, but you know i'd be curious to see what other people's experiences are Hi, author. This is Michelle. Um, Hello. I, 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 over the past uh, few years from both the EU and the FDA, uh, I agree I've seen an increase in that stringency and almost illogically so. Um, hmm. It's uh, such an increased um, stringency that it's almost illogical 
you know, it, they're applying these requirements to long-standing materials, to things with that, that have been used 40, 50 years in industry. And there's really not a, a lot of logic or data um, to um, support, you know, it's not like there's recently known safety or adverse events related to this particular material. And so can you speak a little bit to like, how did we get yeah. to this illogical place with long-standing technology and materials? Yeah, I, I've had some battles on that, that front as well. I remember once, um, those of you who've got kids who, who have asthma and have that the plastic tube that you put on the Ventolin inhaler, the, 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 uh, just so the kid can breathe through more easily, and it's made of polycarbonate. Um, I had the FDA insist on uh, having that material tested by doing a, an implant test, so actually implanting it into rabbits. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and and they wouldn't budge, and I, I lost the client who thought I was incompetent because I couldn't shift the FDA's thinking, and uh, and they and they ended up going and spending hundred thousand dollars doing a whole lot of animal tests um, to satisfy FDA. So yeah, I mean we've all got those horror stories. Um, right, and, and the type of things that you're talking about for for devices like that that are such low cost margins, it's yeah. going to take years. In you know millions of dollars worth of sales to really justify the cost of a hundred plus thousand dollars of biocompatibility testing on something that only costs a few dollars. Yeah, and 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 furthermore, that that thing was made out of three medical grade materials, each of which had fifty odd years worth of of experience behind them. Um, so so I think what's happening here is um, is a couple of things. We've got this change to chemistry. Um, to, to looking at it through a chemical lens, um, and that's starting to take effect. People are doing it. But what we've also got is regulation stepping up in many parts of the world. And what happens when regulation steps up is that um, you get more reviewers hired. And a lot of what we're seeing, particularly from FDA, but not only from FDA, we're seeing it here, we're seeing it in Europe as well, is that um, the easiest way to train a reviewer who's new to the field is to say, here's a checklist, go and check that they've got test reports on this list, and if they have, then pass it, and if not, push back. And that's what we see, and it's when you've got junior reviewers, you have the trouble, and, and you have to escalate. And we find that you know, half the time, if you escalate it, you'll actually get somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's the problem, is that is that um, the knowledge base of the reviewers is not always very good. Man, you you just nailed it because um, since about 2010, the FDA has just gone through a rash of of hiring um, new biomedical engineers with yeah. PhDs right out of college, um, oh. and with no no industry experience, and it's very much that that checklist approach. Um, so so bad to the point that. Um, one year I did two 510Ks for gastro um, D tubes, and I had two brand new reviewers, two different brand new reviewers who had a supervisor. The, and so it was like I was kind of training the two new reviewers, like, well, did you read this guidance document? And they're like, oh, we haven't been checked on that one yet. And then the next year I submitted two more G tubes got two different brand new reviewers and you know who their supervisors were? The two from the previous year. Yeah. So you yeah. really hit the nail on the head there. Yeah, so I, I mean I see that happening all the time. Um, it, it's helpful that I sit on this committee and because a lot of FDA people on the committee, including the ones that write the guidance. Um, so so you know I can usually uh, break the deadlock by calling them up. Not always, but usually. Um, but it's, it is frustrating. Arthur, uh, over here, Andre. Uh, it's One is a basic question that we've come across a couple of times, uh, and it really is the, the definition of what indirect contact is on a patient. Uh, you know, we, we primarily have a lot of non-invasive electrotherapies, and we've come up against where sometimes they requesting all types of testing, and in other cases they don't, and it really comes down to what they consider indirect contact is. I wonder if you had any view on what the definition of that indirect contact is. Yeah, usually, usually indirect contact is where the device itself um, is not 
physically touching the patient, but there's some pathway for an extract to get from the device into the patient. So a good example would be a blood bag, which doesn't touch the patient, but there's a fluid in that bag, plasma or a saline fluid or whatever that goes down a tube and through a needle and into the patient. And so there's an indirect contact. Um, and it, uh, you, you know, phthalates in the, in the blood bag may come out into that fluid and then end up in the, in the bloodstream. So that's what they're, they're talking about. But if you've got, you said you had an, uh, a simulator. Yeah. yeah let me, uh, just to give you a background, uh, in in this one case, we had a device which our instructions for you say that should not be placed upon the patient directly on the skin. Uh, but the 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 FDA came back and said. Well, in order to turn on the device, you have to hit the switch. So therefore, it's contact. But that's really oh. just to, that's really just to turn it on. I've got some good news for you on that one. Okay, um, I, 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 uh, one of the changes that has been made in the latest version, and I'm going to claim the credit for this because I pushed for it last time round and I got it in this time round, is that there's a bit of language in there that says incidental manual contact such as on switches and keyboards doesn't require biocompatibility. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> Great. But Great. yeah, I mean, we have, I've seen that. It's just crazy. Thank you. That's good news. I, I was watching, this is Jan Gates. Hi. I was watching Hi. a um, webinar yesterday where this guy was talking about ETO and how they had actually um, required ETO residuals to be lower than what was in the body to mm -hmm. prevent. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, carcinogenic uh, I, stuff. So, and part of it was because he said the modeling was done incorrectly by the FDA and mm -hmm. the EPA. Mm -hmm. And how, how can we work on that kind of stuff? It's, it just seemed incredible to me when you look at the way they they did their modeling and their data that they came up with the residual amount they had. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not across the latest on that. I know that they've been winding those limits down every time they revise that standard. Um, and it's largely driven by regulators, but not always. Um, it's interesting. So you're saying that it's, it's now the limit is lower than the endogenous amount in the body? Uh, yeah, it's around that, that amount. And it just seems odd to me. <laughs> I think we need another meeting in Japan. Remember, we were talking the other day, and the the, the anecdote that the, the committee met in Japan a few years ago, and we met at the Toure Conference Center. Um, the, the company very kindly gave us the conference center at Mishima in uh, on the coast of Japan, just near Mount Fuji. And uh, Toure, that, that that conference center is 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 next to a huge factory, which is one of the world's largest manufacturing sites for PET that goes into Coke bottles and the like. And the starting material for PET is ethylene oxide. Um, and every time we, were, we went from the meeting uh, to walk back down the, the road to our hotel in the evening past the, uh, the factory wall, we could smell the ethylene oxide coming over the fence. <laughs> we thought it was kind of ironic, but here's this committee meeting on, on oxide residuals, actually breathing in a large amount of it. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't have an answer for you, Jan, but, uh, but uh, if, if that's the case, then people need to start looking at the chemical argument and going back to that standard. Yeah, um, he's supposed here, to, got a quick question. Well, wait, uh, let me tell you that he's supposed to be giving us the uh, slides and I'll post it in Slack when I get them because I think it'd be interesting. To oh, yeah, have people look I can at have them. the slides. I've got them as PDF. I'll, I'll uh, you want me to send them to you, Joe? Yes, please. Yeah, I'll do that. I won't pull the email up again because it's probably going <laughs> to but I'll do that. Your, your, uh, screen is no longer being shared um, just there as I expected uh, a lot of people are asking uh, questions and now the way this is all set up I'm kind of trying to give the camera to whomever is speaking so bye bye Michelle and I'm gonna put Jonathan on and then Mark Fine has a question after Larry Enrit but before that I just want to say how much I love you guys and how much I love having smart friends I, I am just I don't know what the fuck you talked about today, but I just know <laughs> that if somebody uses the word biocompatibility, I have a guy. <laughs> I just, it's something I, I have to worry about a lot in packaging. So it's just so satisfying to, to have this network. I really, I'm just so grateful for you all. And 
like your answer. Joe, Joe there's a, another aspect of biocompatibility with Archer didn't mention, but it's, it's a different viewpoint. It's an essential element in a successful marriage that the two couples are biocompatible. Um, speaking of my own experience, you got to have a lot more than that, but that, but so <laughs> don't think biocompatibility is just materials. Now, I, I would like to uh, kind of reiterate what uh, Michelle said. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an ex FDA guy and ex industry guy, and I deal with clients now as a consultant. And I love your flow chart where the testing is at the end and you and you go through uh, does the material have a history of use in this play in, this, in the same manner? Uh, is, are the manufacturing uh, conditions the same? And uh, get to a point where you may say no testing at all is needed. Well, I tried that with FDA. I've got a client who's building a, an intravascular catheter. All the materials are well known. The company that's making it uh, uses the same manufacturing operation on all of their catheters that they make for other companies. So, uh, and those have all been through bar compatibility testing. And uh, went to FDA through the pre-sub process, pre-submission they call it, and said, we would like to propose this uh, approach to biocompatibility. Uh, gave them all the materials, all the history, talked about the manufacturing and uh, the known additives that might be in it and, and the whole logic and what, and, and FDA said, that's fine, but you still need to do the testing. And, and what FDA has, they have this like this even playing field concept that they don't want to open the floodgates. And my client, you know, they, the people that we deal with the most are the testing laboratories. And I don't know a, a laboratory that's going to tell you not to do the work they want to do. So oh, if, if, you say, if you say to them, we, we want to do biocompatibility testing, they'll give you this whole list of, well, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this, and that's their work, and that's how they make money. And for them to say, well, we won't do this test and we won't do this test, then it puts them, it gives them two problems. One is they're not going to make as much money as it, and the other is you have to come up with the logic as to why you're eliminating the test and, and be able to use that with FDA. And and uh, it's it's almost impossible to get that done. You, Arthur, I, I'm, I'm so happy to make your acquaintance because you are that independent expert <laughs> who, who doesn't make money off of more testing. And, and that's, the kind of, that's the kind of person, to, the, a referee that we need to be able to go to and, and with credibility and, and try and, and, of course, you meet with FDA. I encourage you to continue to push on them uh, this, this whole concept of risk assessment and the flow chart and that whole thing. And the, and the idea of the, the money, uh, Michelle said, is absolutely true. It's a terribly expensive to do this. Startup companies uh, to, to do, dedicate the funds to do a full range of biocompatibility testing, that it's really burdensome for them and sets them back. So bottom line is, uh, I understand what you're saying. Uh, Joe now knows what biocompatibility is. But applying it with the FDA is we're still a long way from that. There's, a, there's an art to it, um, and 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 it's it's still a lottery. You know, there's a big one of the big test houses. I won't name them, but um, they they have on their website some clever marketing guy in that test house. It's one that's been around for decades. Um, took the checklist and built it into a little questionnaire, and you you go on and you and, and you answer the about your device and it then spits out a quote for doing the testing <laughs> <laughs> you know now one of the things is you should never let a lab do what it wants to do you should always have the lab do what you want it to do <laughs> you know and, and you've got to you've got to there's lots of alternates in the protocols and so on but you know they love to just spit out a protocol and say send us your devices we'll test and, and uh, oh yeah absolutely Arthur yeah. and on top of that um, they, they're not the experts in your intended use, your contact duration, all the subtleties of, of the different parts of your parts and pieces of your device. And I see time and time again with my startup companies that didn't get me to help them coordinate with their test lab. And they sent them um, something that might have an electrode buried in it. And the test lab didn't have the wherewithal, knowing it had an electrode in it, to say, you need to take the electrode out or give me permission to do so, and then they fail all their testing. Mm -hmm. And then they have to explain that they sent parts that are non-patient contacting that are embedded in the silicone or whatever. I mean, it, it just turns into a mess. Yeah. 
Um, look, I think there's a couple of things. That, I mean, the lesson here is that doing the, doing biocompatibility is, is is not actually very tractable to standard testing, standard protocols. You you have to understand the device and you have to ask what sort of things you need to do, and you have to do some risk assessment around that. And that takes expertise, and it takes time to think it through. And then you've still got to do some stuff, and you've got to you've usually got to develop some bespoke protocols. So that takes time and money. And uh, manufacturers are reluctant to make the intellectual investment as well as the financial investment. And regulators are certainly reluctant to do that, largely because they're not capable of. Well, I'm being unkind. They're not always capable of doing it just because their, their workloads are so great. They've got lots of inexperienced reviewers. Simpler checklist approach. After I have a question on um, on the uh, risk assessment. You, you mean you say you need a qualified risk assessment, but what qualification do you need? So no, sorry, that was Luke. Sorry, <laughs> that was Luke cutting ahead of all the other questions. But go ahead. <laughs> um, what, what I mean, the the. You do a risk assessment um, for a device. You know, part of the regulatory program is that, mm -hmm. is that you do a, a one four nine seven one risk assessment, where you identify all the hazards, and if it's an electrical device, that you know, electrical safety is one of the hazards, and you test using electrical safety testing and all the rest of it, um, and you decide, you know, that the electrical safety guys now have got risk management built into their standard, where you don't have to do all the testing, particularly if it's a, you know, a low voltage device driven by a by a nine volt battery rather than something that's connected to main power. Um, the same is true for biology. So you 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 look at the the device, you decide what's present in terms of what substances are present and how much of them can, you know, what kind of dose they can be delivered to the patient in, in the extracts, and then you can work out the risk because you can go to the literature and you know what the toxicological profile of those substances. You know how poisonous they are or not. Um, you're and not, so, you're not required to have a qualification to do the literature review. Yeah, so so you need to be somebody who understands the toxicology literature can read that and make make the arguments. Yeah, and if you don't have it at hand, where do you get it? You have to come and hire somebody to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean that's always the case, um, but that's like any expertise. You know, if you don't have a software expert, you got to go and hire one. Um, mm -hmm. It's always the case. Joe, you've got some more questions. I do, and please, first, an administrative note. Um, given how many questions are coming in, and as we evolve, how do I work managing all of this in, in a family setting like this? I think what I'm going to do from this week on, I'm going to, quote unquote, cancel all the rest of the ones that are in the queue, and I'm going to set up a new one. Nobody is going to be an organizer or a panelist straight away. Everyone's going to be a guest where I can't see your face and I can't see your, and I can't hear your voice. I'll have the panelist and me start the conversation. And then as people contribute, have a question or something, I'll move them over and give them the next spot. And then mm -hmm. I'll have like up to four people. And then for example, now the next person to ask is going to be uh, Mark, so I'm going to kick Larry out. He's had his air time, and <laughs> we'll we'll just kind of rotate that way. I think that will work, and it will minimize confusion, and uh, it'll stop the heresy of other people controlling my screen and kicking everybody out. There we go. John Richard Stockton has a question. Okay, uh, sound okay? Yep. Yeah. There is something, there's something I've really been wanting to ask. Uh, the context is uh, one of my frequent modes of operation is I will be helping a small organization. They will have a young engineer and they will be developing some device. It's not uncommon that they will be doing something and they won't have, they won't really have a good understanding of what the consequences of that will be. Or, and this is where we come into this, a method of evaluating a choice of materials, construction methods, things like this. And so, um, in in designs, we develop thing, we develop design and process FMEAs. And what we're doing is we're evaluating the risk of other factors 
uh, unintended factors or possibly tertiary or relevant factors um, influencing the performance of you know the performance of what we're trying to do whether it's the construction of it or its operation in the patient in the environment and so my question was is there is there a science-based method of evaluation designed to determine the effect of non-relevant factors anecdotal data tangential profit motives uh, on regulation and policy or in this case on the on the approvability or acceptability of materials is, is there is there a science-based evaluation to to help screen yeah. out some of that on the on the materials themselves um yeah. so yes remember that overwhelming slide of all the different standards um yeah. one of them is the risk assessment one so it's it's in there in part 17 that's the good news so the people have thought that through and build a mathematical model around it and what have you the bad news is that's being rewritten and everybody's having a huge argument over that at the moment. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's going to change. Um, but there is, and, and fundamentally that's about um, sa saying again, what is the material? What do we know about its chemistry? What's present? Um, what substances can you get out of it? And then build some safety factors into the model. And, and you, you, you build safety factors according to the nature of the contact and the nature of the duration and the uncertainty around the chemistry and all the rest of it. Um, uh, and, and one of the cute things about that is it says, when, when the safety factor gets up to a thousand stock, don't keep adding more safety factors <laughs> because, because you can you know, make it impossible. Um, so, so there is there, the answer is yes. There is a model in there. Now that but to be specific, very, that model is. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm just saying that not that many people use it at the moment. It's still, it's still um, something that that's um, gaining traction. Yes, and and I wasn't even talking about the safety of the material per se, but the safety of its um, the likelihood that it will be hard to get it approved due to tangential factors that really have nothing to do like for instance a material where many many tests are just blanket required as you were describing before um it's sort of a it's oh, sort see. of a how how much how much hair is there going to be on the you know how much hair will there be on the evaluation of this material yeah um i've not come across any sort of standard uh, you know model for doing that but I, but it's something that that, that that crosses a lot of people's minds is just how difficult it's going to be sure um i'm doing it in my head and i wanted to see if there is a model no i mean basically that, 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 that you know and this is so terribly anti-innovative of course because yep. there's a huge incentive here not to change materials which is why we're still using the same fairly small subset of medical grade materials that we've been using for decades. And people come along with a new one, you talk, you know, you come along with a new polymer that may be better at making pacemaker leads, you're talking half a million dollars minimum to, to establish the, set, the biological safety, because you've got to do all the tests. You've got to do carcinogenicity tests, which are animal studies that take two years, you know. Um, uh, You've got to do the whole thing. So there's a huge disincentive to innovate materials. In, in about five world. years ago, I started getting all of these medical device group questions about graphene. Yeah. So probably that case where, yeah, that sounds nice, but I'm not paying for that. Yeah. Um, I had, had an interesting story a couple of weeks ago. Um, company developing a way of, uh, there's a thing called boron nitride nanotubes. Of course there is. Mm -hmm. Right? These are exotic exotic ceramic fibers, <laughs> really strange exotic ceramic fibers. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, people say, well, if you could make them in large enough amounts, they'd be great for making bulletproof vests or medical devices and all sorts of things. And uh, somebody reckoned they figured out a way to make them mass produce them cheaply. And I said, that's great. Um, but the problem is we don't know anything about the biological safety, and that's the reason is because there's less than a kilo of this stuff exists on the planet, um, and people have now wanted to make you know hundreds of kilo amounts. 
Um, and, se and, and secondly, uh, the very, very long, very thin fibers, um, you know, aspect ratios of a thousand or something. Um, and, uh, you know, here in Australia, we should know about the history here because you should still use the history when it's bad as well. There's another very, very long, thin fiber um, called blue asbestos, uh, <laughs> you know, which we know is a really dangerous stuff. Um, and I don't want to be in the factory that mass produces these nanotubes. So, um, you know, sometimes it works the other way, Joe. Okay, uh, Jonathan, you're up. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Arthur, and maybe this is more of an open question for everyone. What year do you think we are going to see a major shift from animal testing to artificial intelligence modeling, where that becomes the standard? Uh, I think we've got a bit of a way to go with artificial intelligence. Um, uh, but certainly, uh, some of the risk assessment stuff that's in part 17, um, where you're looking at the substances present, are already using computer modeling. So, you know, we've always had this in vivo for doing it in animals and in vitro for doing it in cell culture. Well, they now talk about in silico. Um, <laughs> I think there's a lovely sort of uh, academic jargon for using a computer. Um, <laughs> um, and, and you know, so these these bio compatibility scientists use that phrase. Um, but they the the point is that um, there are three or four well established software packages which look at the output from the chemistry um, analysis, look at the chemical structures and the, the molecular structures and particular functional groups and all that sort of stuff and can make some assessments as to the likelihood that something's carcinogenic, carcinogenic for example. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that already, and I think AI is certainly going to play a part there. Um, it'll take some time. You know, the regulators will want to see big databases that sit behind it, and lots of stats before they'll accept it. But I'm sure it's do, going to be. Do you think it's five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years um, from now? You know, I think it's probably sooner than we think. Usually, the, the, the rate of change is so great. You know, um, I mean, I've taken an artificial intelligence device through FDA for diagnostic, uh, and and we got it through. But they still wanted a you know a fairly conservative approach to that, where the where the the algorithms had been developed by AI, but they wanted the algorithms fixed so that you know if, if you change the algorithm, we have to go and do another clinical trial. Um, but but they're going on from that now. They're now allowing training algorithms to train, providing you've got some kind of touch point. Yeah, you, know, you think it's going to be led by the material science people? A quick administrative note, please. We're going to lose Rick, and Mark just had to excuse himself because it's the top of the hour. For the how I'm going to set up the next ones, I was wondering, uh, and you can type in your answer, would you prefer that I keep it at the top of the hour or move it to 15 past? Because the West Coast starts at 8 a.m., 8.15 might make a difference to some people. So go ahead and tell me if you prefer top of hour or 15 after the hour for when I reset it. Um, you don't care because you're never coming <laughs> again if you speak because um, it's two in the morning now uh, but uh, if you wouldn't mind telling me that that would be helpful thank you um, Jonathan I interrupted please go ahead no problem I, I was just wondering if you think that this is going to be a move by testing companies or if it's going to be a move by the material science groups that will it'll, make the big it, push It'll come from the toxicologists, people who actually analyze the chemistry and, and figure it and do the risk assessments. I think I think those guys and you know and, and it won't it won't come from the medical device world. It'll come from medicines or more likely uh, environmental, where where a lot of this toxicology, you know, a lot of the literature that's relied on in medical devices is fundamentally environmental safety literature. You know, people are worried about the substances in the water supply, for example. Right. Okay. Sue? Oh, um, there's your mic. Okay. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could extrapolate a little bit about predicate devices. I mean, I have a few, and I don't know how to narrow it down. And that was my first question. And the second one, you had said, let the lab do what you want to do, not what they want to do. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess the FDA will define that once I have my pre-submit meeting with them. Um, but I have my own ideas and they have theirs. But m more importantly, I'm, I'm kind of narrowing down two predicate devices. I have a medical device, a kind of a filter removal of glass. Um, and uh, we're preparing for pre-FDA. Okay, uh, I don't know if your question on predicates is more general um, outside of biocompatibility, but I'll answer it within the biocompatibility zone, mm -hmm. if you like. I mean, ideally, you want to be choosing predicate devices in the US that, that are made of the same stuff. Um, and if, if they're not, you've got to be able to show that your materials are um, equivalent um, in terms of biological safety, and that may mean that you, you, know, you know, that doesn't mean they've got to be identical. They've got to not got to be identical chemically, even. They may be a different polymer, for example, or a different metal, but they need to. Um, the equivalence is is expressed in terms of compliance with ISO 10993. So, if the predicate device was found to be biologically safe when evaluated under the guidance of 10993 and the FDA by compatibility guidance, then you need to do the same. And if you can jump over the same bar, then you're re reckoned to be biologically equivalent. So if I, if I use the same polymers in building, you know, part of my device, then, then it should be okay, right? Well, it should be, but the, the, there's, there's, two, there's two parts of this. Um, it's the material itself and it's the way you process it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, ideally, ideally you want those to be as close as possible, but if they're different, you don't worry about that too much because, as I say, it's, you, you're not setting out a predicate, you're not setting out to show that it's identical, you're setting out, that it, you're setting out to show that it meets the same test of safety, the same measure of safety. Yes whether that's a biological test or whether it's chemistry and risk assessment, but you're setting out to show that you meet the, re the requirements of 1093. So that's what, that's the bar you've got to jump over. Yeah. Um, and ideally, you you know, if it's, if it's, if it's a polymer, um, it needs to be the same kind of polymer, preferably. Uh, you know, if you move to a metal, then you're getting into a different place. <laughs> but but you've got wiggle, a lot of wiggle room with polymers, for example. You know? It's it's just out of portion, and, but I think I can, you know, use this very uh, I can use a similar device mm -hmm. as a predicate. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You okay. bet. Thank you. Uh, so instead of uh, just kind of chatting more, which I tend to like to do at the end of the presentations, let the man go to sleep. <laughs> That's all right. I'm wide awake. <laughs> Are you? Yeah. Yeah. I can carry on a little, little longer if you want to. Well, the questions have been exhausted. Um, I put on the screen what the next couple of weeks are. And uh, again, you're all going to get a cancellation that NBG premium calls have been canceled. Don't be alarmed. I'm setting up a new one. Mm -hmm. Arthur, you're a smart dude. <laughs> about that. No, I, 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 don't know, I don't know smart or crazy to be involved in this stuff. <laughs> no, your choice. And Ryan Carpenter said uh, he was asking about your TGA wherewithal, to which I respond, yeah, you're my go-to for TGA as well. Yeah, the, the, one of the other things I did, I used to be head of device evaluations at TGA, so... Um, you're a smart dude. But my son, since I was a regulator for a while. Um, so, I was yeah. just pointing out that the uh, TGA guidelines are much clearer than the MedDev uh, for sure and, and the MDR too. Yeah, they tend to be more succinct. Um, yeah. The, 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 you know, TGA is a tiny agency. It, it, there's about 100 people in, in the agency doing medical devices, so they struggle more than FDA does for just getting the right expertise on a particular issue. They do remarkably well for what they for what they've got. The uh, folks on the call can see that I have July third, uh, which I assume you guys want to hold. Those of you who celebrate July four and uh, July ten open, so I'm looking for other smart people telling us things I don't understand. So uh, write me a note in Slack or offer yourself. Um, and uh, I've opened all of the lines, so if anyone else has anything they want to say before we let him go to sleep, 
this is the time to do it. Thank you, Arthur. Especially for I've got another question. It has nothing to do with biocompatibility, though. Sure. I'm giving you the camera. If I can figure okay. out how. I'll have to uncover my camera. Good. Yep. Hi. So, um, yeah, the question is just uh, about um, clinical evaluation, equivalent devices, um, and of course with the MVR and the specifics of. Um, uh, of needed to have an equivalent if you don't have clinical data on the device. Um, mm -hmm. Well, first of all, this is changing with the uh, delay in the MDR. So uh, I guess that opens uh, opens the door to kind of go backwards if companies want to do that, but mm -hmm. um, <laughs> temporarily. But the question is, uh, yeah, okay, well, you may have already answered the question. Um, well, I, I'm. I, I face this question not from a regulatory strategy standpoint, but from a review of clinical literature uh, standpoint, where I'm trying to make decisions about what to include, what to exclude, what I'm considering clinical literature, what I'm considering state of the art. And uh, any of this work that I've done has always been in new devices. So they're really preclinical evaluations. So, you know, it's pretty clear when you have a device on the market what is clinical data and what is not. Uh, what's less clear is when there's a company that doesn't have clinical data and mm -hmm. you're doing a literature review. And, you know, if you read the letter of the law, as a consultant, I should say to clients, you don't have clinical literature, therefore, um, you know, I shouldn't, I, I just can't even do the uh, uh, do the review for you right now. Come back when you're ready because you can't have approval until you have clinical literature. Mm -hmm. And yet that's not the way it seems to work. Can you just no. comment on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, let, me, let me just uh, clarify a couple of things. Um, firstly, your, your first part of your question, um, the European guidance on clinical evaluation, uh, the famous MedDev 2.7 slash 1 version 4, that's the kind of regulatory geek I am, Joe. I remember the number. Yes, <laughs> um, I remember the number. Um, <laughs> um, that was updated to version 4 in preparation for the MDR. Um, it's expected yep. to go to version 5 at some stage soon. Um, and the notified bodies were pushed very hard to 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 evaluate against it, even under the MDD. Um, it ain't going to go backwards. That's the uh, and and it reflects what's been the intent in the old medical device regulations. But the regulations were so poorly framed. Yeah, I agree. Through them. Hence um, my comment about the guidance. First part, it ain't going to go back. Um, yeah. Second is. Um, what do you mean by clinical evaluation? I'll tell you what I mean by it, um, uh, uh, clinical evidence. Yep. Evidence is clinical data which has been reviewed by a clinical expert. It's the, ev the evidence is the endpoint of the, of the clinical review. The data are not just clinical trials. The data are everything yes, that yes. speaks to validation that the device is going to work in the real world. So the data may be clinical trial data if you've got it, or it may be a comparison to similar devices, or it may be some of that preclinical testing that you did. You say, well, we know that if we've done this, these things we've done usability, then it's a good chance it'll work in the clinic. It may be um, post-market data on other devices or on your own device that's been in other markets. So it, it's the, the whole point about clinical evaluations, it's very broad based these days, and, you, and you're yep. expected to do all of those things. Yeah, that that I definitely understand, and I, I think in principle all, all of that is clear. It's really a matter of execution. So, for yeah. instance, uh, right now I'm uh, doing a review on a um, on a battery powered electric drill, and the comparison would be a, would be a manually powered uh, handheld drill. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the the comparison for practical purposes. That is, if I'm a surgeon and I'm not using one, the other thing I would use the other, and the other would be a manually powered drill. So you know, by equivalent standpoints, by uh, by the clinical data section or the clinical, you know, the clinical literature review, where you're where you're meant to be looking at uh, at data from generated with the device. You know, this mm -hmm. is clearly a different kind of device with a different uh, you know different materials, different mode of operation, and so on. But from mm -hmm. a practical standpoint, it's an obvious um, alternative to the device. Mm -hmm. So. You know, if it's if it's not part of the clinical data, you know, generated with the device or a device that has been uh, demonstrated to be equivalent, then you know, 
this would be outside of the clinical uh, the clinical data section, but is obviously still clinical evidence that's important. Uh, that it's more in the realm of the uh, of the state of the art and how the device fits into the competitive yeah. uh, landscape. Yeah. Uh, let me put it this way: the way I think of us, the way that this clinical evaluation requirement that's evolved in Europe and has been applied in other parts of the world, and you know, Australia, by the way, TGA thinks that they sort of smile quietly and say, "Ah, Europe's finally caught up with our practice um, because we've been doing it that way for some years." Um, okay. The the the, the, the I I think of the clinical evaluation report as the summary of the entire regulatory dossier yeah yeah but what it is 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 looking at um you know all of the evidence that says this thing's going to work in the clinic and, and so you're actually re -pre re 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 revisiting the whole yeah so data. can i can i interpret yeah. this response to mean that when i'm yeah the, the 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 letter of the law says you know you need uh you need acceptance criteria, quantitative acceptance criteria, analysis just should be a priori. Um, you should have a detailed protocol. You know, the description mm -hmm. is very much like that of a Cochrane review, but a Cochrane review, according to the literature, takes a year of elapsed time and costs $100,000. So that's obviously, you know, more than more than people are willing to do and more than is practical. So can I take it to mean that I should focus less on on the on the letter of the law and more on the notion of, you know, gathering the clinical evidence that, uh, you know, by, by a rational approach is relevant and applicable. Yeah, and for a drill, it's a, a, a class two device in the US, a 2A in Europe. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, I would be surprised that you would need actual clinical trial information on that. You, you need to basically show that it, it functions mm -hmm. in the same way as all the other drills out there. Right, right. So that, yeah, that's exactly that's exactly the question. When I'm doing the literature review and I'm meant to have an a priori protocol, you know, I find myself asking, you know, this just this just seems silly. Uh, you know, I'm doing this extensive review, and really, I could probably grab the latest systematic review and say, you know, this is device this device is used in all sorts of procedures. And, well, that's yeah. the way I would. That's the way I'd approach that. By the way, I would. I would set my uh, selection criteria for the clinical literature very narrowly to say we're just going to look at the most, you know, the, the last five years. I'm going to look at systematic reviews and, and uh, you know, uh, the, 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 those those documents because these these things have been around forever, you know. Yeah. So, so there's no point looking at everybody's case report on them. Hey, we did this with this surgeon, this patient, and something went funny with Clearly. the probing. Um, you, you, you just look at, and so you might end up with just two or three papers, but they will show you what the state of the art is. Okay. Yep. Yeah. That's that's helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. I still have one question. Yeah. Um, it's about um, the standard says that the tests are. Um, uh, differentiated in limited, prolonged, and that kind of stuff. And we're limited to 24 hours, and prolonged is up to 30 days. How does it go with uh, with testing? Is it just, say you have a device, sorry, shall I put my microphone better? S say you have a device that you only use for five minutes. Is the test yeah. then still for 24 hours? Or say you have a device that you take, uh, you put on a, on a patient, set him home and get him back. And the time between is usually slightly more than 24 hours. There's still a time between, say, it's 26 hours. Mm -hmm. You still have to test them for 30 days. No. So, so um, the way you think about exposure time is yes. cumulative actual use of the device. Yes. But it yeah. can be. Say, say you put something on a patient and you send him home, mm -hmm. and you you get him back after a day, and it can mm -hmm. be say 26 hours, and the limit. Was for, it actually, uh, was it, sorry, was it actually fixed to the patient for that 26 hours, or was it in their bag it, it, and then they out and used it for an no, hour? You 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 want to use them. Uh, you want to send them home for a day and get them back. Yeah. Yeah. So you can say that's 24 hours, but. Usually in a in a medical practice, it can be say uh, you you get them in the morning and they get back a little bit later in the morning because first you have yeah. to put on your new clients. 
Mm. So it's it's 26 hours, but the testing mentions only uh, limited and prolonged, and limited is 24 hours, and prolonged is up to 30 days. Yes. Do you have so, to apply so, for a 30-day testing when you send them home for, to 20, say, 26 hours? So, so the, the way I would deal with that is um, going back to the famous checklist, I would look at the list and say, okay, what additional things does the standard ask me to do if, if the device is used for 30 days rather than one day? And then I would uh, look at whether, you know, so it may, for example, um, ask you to do a systemic toxicity test where previously you only had to do irritation sensitization. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, I would say, okay, it's only just going over 24 hours. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd start to ask questions about, well, what, you know, in, in a 26 hour exposure time, how much leachable could I actually physically deliver? Uh, and can I do, can I deliver enough to, to, to have a systemic effect? And I'd start to go down that road and make a justification that we didn't need to do the extra testing. And Luke's microphone's off, I think. <laughs> Unmute it. Yeah. So you, you just uh, take it like risk management and say, what's the risk of the extra two hours? Something like that. Yeah, and and see, so, you know, so typically if you go into the next the next bracket, you, you they add more testing. Yes, that, and so, that's what, yeah, what I'm yeah. afraid of. Yeah, and so you ask the question, you know, is that actually necessary? Um, is it meaningful? But you've got to, you, in all of these things, that's the problem with biocompatibility. You've actually got to sort of bring scientific thought to it. <laughs> yeah, also the, the strange thing is you have some material which you have a record that it's not irritating on the skin, but you cannot yeah. prove it. And if you add a double-sided adhesive in between and the double-sided adhesive is tested, then you're all set because mm. it's adhesive that's making contact to the skin. Well, it's proven um, about three percent of people with adhesive to the skin get an irritation. Yeah, maybe, but you know, when you've got something with a thin layer of adhesive, you get down to that indirect contact again, where you might say, "Well, you get sweat yeah. soaked through the adhesive and extract stuff from the material the other side of it." So, you know, anyway. Jonathan, what are we looking at? Oh, I, I was just looking at some some things that. Are in relation to this this topic because uh, you know this in silico idea. I just think that you know so much of safety, at least in my experience from what I've seen, a lot of things are looked at in isolation. And you know, I, I'm always looking at balancing benefit and risk. Um, you know, whether it's an investment or in a in evaluating a medical device. Um, and I just think that these subjects are so complex that uh, we do need to move towards more of an in silico model. I know it's not simple, but um, you know, if if we have something that's going to, like, for example, alleviate chronic pain for for the lifetime of the person, um, but it's going to um, twofold increase the the risk of a heart attack. You know, what's what's yeah, what's, what's the value? risk? Yeah. Just oh, no. I made a new chronic pain friend last week, if anyone needs one. Not because you're suffering from chronic pain, but also if you are. And, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, you also shared this link. What is this? These are just, you know, and I, I have categories of subjects that I'm looking at that are due for disruption. Obviously, this is a category that I think is due for disruption. And so I'm looking at different entities and think groups that are um, trying to push forward uh, these these areas. Um, and so I just didn't know if there were other ones that people could recommend for me to look at. Um, but I'm always looking for uh, leaders and places where leaders congregate to um, to talk about how how to disrupt this industry and and how to make improvements in in value. Okay, fair enough. Um, so I have a I question or co comment. Yeah, please. Yeah, I just have a question. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, sure. We, okay. Okay. I don't know you, 
Thomas. I do. Go ahead and yeah. reintroduce. Okay. Me. Hi, yeah, I'm Andrea. So uh, I, I just have a, a question, I guess, and a comment. Um, you know, we're in a kind of a startup situation um, and getting to the, the issues of, you know, the expenses of these tests and what we can afford in a commercial sort of situation. Uh, you know, we've actually had a situation recently where we we're looking to make a material change and, and we're basically doing vent tubes, so silicone devices and ear tubes, um, making a material change in one of our devices. And, you know, on the advice of a few people said, you know, you might want to take a look at doing the sort of the chemical risk-based approach. Uh, if you get some, the right numbers there, you can, then when you, in the future, when you make material changes, you can compare materials and, and make rationale that, that allow you to do that more effectively. I mean, the problem that we run into is that, you know, for a small company, that's um, that just the cost of doing that is so much higher than just doing the old checkbox. Okay, here's the four tests yeah. that the FDA requires, yeah. and we're just going to do that. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have any sort of comment on that, because I think, I mean, it's, for me, it's a little frustrating in some ways, because I would like to do it in the more, you know, modern, new way, I guess, but um, mm -hmm. the practicality of survival in the, in, and no, you, you're right. Like, you just you tend to check the box because that's the easy yeah. path. You're right, particularly if it's a low risk device where there's not much biological testing required. Right. Then sometimes right. it's just to do it. Um, yeah. the, the the issue that will start to arise, I think, is because the standard now says you have to understand the material. You may right. start to find regulators saying, "Well, yes, you've done the testing, but we want you we want to see you do right. some chemistry as well." And I've seen that in yeah. Europe already. Uh, yeah, and, that, and that's and that's sort of the yeah, and that's the other piece of this is you know the the there there's conflicting. There's a specific guidance for our device by the FDA that was offered quite a while ago, but it was reviewed in 2018 and still found to be current. And they only list four tests in there and make no mention of you know any of the more recent sort of developments from 10993. And I think it's just nobody ever actually looked at it when they reviewed the guidance. To be quite frank. And, it's, and and so there's a little bit of a question of you know materials change normally wouldn't be something that we would need to go to a five to do a 510k for, um, but then you know there's in the back of my mind is if anybody ever comes to review this, do you you know do you are you do you want to be proactively more conservative and actually do more testing even though the guidance says you don't need to really do that. Um, it, it, it becomes a bit of a commercial decision, doesn't it, as to what, what right, your pathways? Yeah, are. exactly. Yep. Better invest in future design iterations. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just my, my comments on the topic. It's just, mm -hmm. but this has been very helpful. It's a very good overview. Arthur, yeah. I tried to let you go to sleep, but they wouldn't hear of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to go. I'm, I'm, off off I'm, I'm making an exception because I'm curious to meet Ray Walker, and uh, I don't typically extend the camera invitation to non-premium folks, but um, the Walkers attended a few of these now, and I'd love to know about. Ray, you, your mic is open. Oh, all right. Um, I'm the president of a 40-some-year-old company um, that I founded you years ago, cam, Ray? Silicon, Silicon Medical Devices. Do you have a webcam so we can see you? It's showing that you can now. Send webcam request. I don't know. Nope, <clears throat> still no, but please continue. Um, I'm a client of um, Michelle's. Oh, okay. And we are uh, getting, trying to finish off our MDR, but the products are all, that we, we predate the FDA. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, there's a lot of things that have just been historical, you know, basis for us. And mm -hmm. we did clinicals, um, we did biocompatibility tests, you know, what, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, our concern is what we're going to have to do all over again. And so that's why I was sitting in today. Okay. So uh, what, what sort of devices and materials? You said something about silicones? They're class 2, 2A in Europe. They're wound yeah. drains. We were the first silicone company to to develop a line back in 77. Mm -hmm. And uh, to improve 
over the rubber and PVC that was out there at that time, both for patient comfort and efficiency. Um, and they've been they've been distributed worldwide. So we're just concerned as to how much testing we're going to have to go back and redo just to get into Europe. We had our we had our mm -hmm. um, CE marked before, and the manager of the company let it lapse. So now yeah. we're having to reapply. <laughs> yeah. What, one one of the challenges you'll get in Europe. Um, on testing is that, uh, and I've seen this particularly in Europe, is that a number of the notified bodies take the view that once the biocompatibility data are more than five years old, that they become, they, they expire. Um, and, and the rationale is that materials change with time, that you might have different suppliers, different processes in the manufacturing, and you need to test, retest them from time to time. So I have seen that happen. Um, so you've got to guard against that by documenting that your materials are not changing. That we're doing. Yeah. So you know, if you can show that you've still got the same formulations, that nothing's changed, that you, that the manufacturing is, you've got to be able to say that the material is formulated and manufactured the same way as the stuff that was originally tested. And if that stuff was tested 20 years ago, that's hard to do. This is these devices are equivalent to urinary catheters in terms of continuous use and contact time and that. Um, however, um, we started out with all GE materials, GE, you know, subdivided and sold off things. So there's yeah. there's my, my, my uh, relative point is companies. To... I can't talk about the formulation being the same, but it but our everything with once we get it is all the same. Yeah. Um, the question is, what? How, how much confidence do you have about what went on in the factory that made those materials 20 years ago? Uh, I, I saw them, so I know, you know, I'm yeah. fairly okay. confident. Well, that, that, that'd be unusual, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay. Thank you. Ray, consider joining us, and I can get you Arthur's particulars as well. Okay. Let me figure out how to do that later. I'm not a computer whiz, so I don't know what. <laughs> okay, all good. Um, it might be okay for biocompatibility, but you're going to have other things that have changed in the test standards that will have to be redone. So make sure you know about that, too. Oh, that's a good point. Thank you. Jan's your go-to for packaging. Yes. I know that's changed a lot. Just in the last three yeah. years, so. And you, 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 just the catheter standard as well. Okay. Arthur, I'm going to invoke my executive privilege as host of this call to say this call is over. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Super <laughs> in the morning. Yes. I'm going to go to uh, bed. Given that uh, we're the last thoughts to go through your mind tonight, maybe maybe dream about us and tell us about it in the morning. Yeah. Um, Indeed. So, so, <laughs> so did Enjoy you say? That? Yeah, I, I, I will. Thank you. <laughs> that was great, Arthur. Thank you. And, Thank you. Uh, Good night, everyone. Next week, Good and night. online anytime you like. Bye for now. Thank Bye. you very much. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.